Well, good morning. Good morning. Everybody ready? <laughs> okay, you. one person's ready. <laughs> Woo -hoo! All right, we got we got a few people ready. Well, guys, it is great to see you here this morning, and uh, we're just going to begin by singing um, one of my favorite songs. It's an old hymn uh, that we've kind of Chris Tomlin updated it a little bit as Jesus paid it all. Right. <laughs> In Acts 4, verses 8 through 12, it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved.
Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Amen.
Light shine among us, glory revealed. Living He loves me, dying He saved me, bearing me, carrying my sins far away. Rising He justified, freely forever. One day He's coming, all glory. Psalm 119, it says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Your word 
is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. We are not what we should be. We haven't sought what we should see. We've seen your glory, Lord, but looked away. Our meant, our eyes are dim. Our finest works are stained with sin. And emptiness has shadowed all our ways. But what? Jesus Christ, shine into our night. Drive our dark. Till your glory fills our lives. Jesus Christ, shine into our light. Find us to your cross where we find
Jesus, thank you for calling us back to you when we go astray, when we're not following your path the best that we could, Lord. And we just ask that you would be with us this week, Lord, that you would guide our steps, that you would be in our hearts, be in our mouths, be in our thoughts, so that we can do everything that we do to glorify you and that others would be drawn to you through us, through our actions, through our words, Lord. That is the cry of our hearts is that we would glorify you in everything that we do, Lord. Pray that you would be in this service today, Lord, that you would be in Rod's mouth, that the words that he speaks are not of him, Lord, but of you, and that our ears would hear what you have to say through him. In your name we pray. One, two, there it is, better, so sorry that the, the people back in the tech tell me what I'm supposed to do and what I'm not supposed to do, and so, um, well, this morning we are going to be continuing in this uh, book of Philippians, and Philippians is, is probably one of the most encouraging of uh, the books that Paul wrote, right, um, but it does challenge us, right? Because what it does is it puts a mirror up in front of us and we have to look at how Paul responded to the situations in his life and then we look at ourselves and we go, does that match? And oftentimes um, it might not. And so um, as we saw last week, we were kind of looking and we saw how Paul's predicament, right, how he dealt with the predicament that he was in. Does anyone remember what a predicament is? No? Okay, a situation you're in that is difficult to deal with or get out of, right? And so uh, that's really what we saw. And we saw that Paul was where? He was in prison, right? Um, And it really wasn't where he wanted to be, right? Right? Anyone been there? Anyone there now? Like a place where you don't really want to be, but you're there anyway, right? Okay. Um, But what we saw is that Paul found joy in the midst of the predicament because he was looking the right way. And he was looking for the gospel to be advanced. And... um, even those who were trying to stir up trouble with him and, and cause problems for him, all of those people, as they were doing that, he continued to find the silver lining in the dark cloud, right? That he continued to focus his mind on the right things, and it created a way for him to have joy in the midst of the difficult circumstances. Well, today, we're going to pick up on that same part of Scripture, um, and we're specifically going to be looking at Philippians chapter 1. We're starting in verse 18, and we're going to look at Paul's perseverance. Now, I'll warn you, okay, when I was preparing for this message, I was like, I'm going to get through eight verses. 
Some of you are laughing because you know me, right? Um, I got through two. So um, just buckle up because it's going to be really good and rich because this, this is what Paul does to us. He does it all the time. Um, perseverance. What is perseverance? Don't read it. Come on. Good, good. Pushing through something that's difficult, right? It's dealing with difficult circumstances and yet still continuing to stay the course, right? To continue to go. Uh, perseverance is persistence in doing something despite difficult or delay in achieving success, right? And this is what we're going to see in Paul's case as well, that Paul has this stick to That's what I remember growing up hearing it, right? stick to like you're not going to give up. Can I tell you, this is lost in our culture, right? I mean, just really, like if something gets tough, when, when, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? And, and, and it's like, man, we just, perseverance, like ending strong, right? Finishing well. It's a, it's a challenge. Now, I'll, I'll be honest with you. This is, this is something that is difficult for all of us to deal with because, quite frankly, when things are tough, we don't like the frustration, we don't like the pain, right? And so oftentimes, we retreat to safety instead of pushing through. And, and we're going to see how Paul does this in this passage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 and, and even little ways, right? So, like, we, we give up on even trying to figure out what the word is or, or whatever else, and so we'll, we'll look it up on Google just because it's easier, right? And we've conditioned ourselves to follow into that pattern. But we're going to see God's word tells us something different. So, start in verse 18, Right? Verse 18, the last little phrase there, he says, Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. That's it. That's all we're going to cover. Now, why, why aren't we going on? Because the next verse is so big and so rich and so full that there's no way that I could cover it with everything that we've got to cover. Because what's the next verse? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that's going to take a whole work to go through that one. But I want you to see where we're at. Once again, notice how Paul starts this information, right? He starts it with the idea of joy. In fact, if we go back even one more sentence, we're going to see that he's drawing upon the previous idea, right? Kind of like a therefore right, that we so, see what it's there for. So he's drawing upon the same idea that we just got off of, these difficult circumstances that Paul is in. Well, what are those circumstances? Well, he's under house arrest, right? He's chained to a guard 24-7. He can't go out. He can't provide for himself. He has no way to support himself. And others are out sharing the exact news that Paul wants to be sharing, right? He's wanting to go out and tell people the good news. And so people are out there sharing it. And some people are sharing it because, man, they see Paul and they're like, man, I got to go out and do this. But other people are sharing the exact same news only with bad intention, right? They're sharing the news trying to get Paul into more trouble because Paul is on trial. And they're trying to figure out, is this guy a, a, a guy who stirs up trouble and creates riots? Because if he is, 
we need to get him out of the kingdom, right? We, we, Rome can't have people who are dissonants and, and causing problems. And so Paul is in this place. And so in verse 18, he says, and because of this, right? Because of what? All of this stuff, these difficult circumstances, because of all of this, I rejoice. What? Does that make any sense to anyone? Because of all the bad stuff that's going on in my life right now, I'm going to rejoice. Right? He says, and yes, and I will continue to rejoice. I, I want you to see this. Paul is doubling down. Right? Remember, he's repeating this phrase. Right? I do rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice. Like, he's, he's like, look, I'm, I'm finding a good spot in the midst of this, and I'm going to continue. Right? And again, I say rejoice, right? We hear that, okay? Now, Paul, Paul's mentioning, this double mention of rejoicing, is, he's pointing to something that I think it's important for us to realize, Okay? How do you find joy in difficult circumstances? It is a choice. Joy is a choice. Joy is not something that happens to you. Right? Joy is not something that happens just, eh, here it is, right? All of a sudden, oh, I'm just overwhelmed with joy. Now, there may be moments in your life where that happens, but joy is not something that is just an emotion that overwhelms us. Joy is a choice. It is a mindset that we adopt. And we can adopt that mindset in any circumstance. It has nothing to do with our experience in the moment. And this is one of the things that we have to wrestle through because what we set our mind on is what we're going to see. What we look for, we will see. Look at Paul in verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Now, I'm just telling you, this, this verse has got so much in it, you don't even realize. I mean, that's not very many words, but there is a ton that Paul is packing into these few statements. The first thing that we see is that Paul mentions one of the reasons for his joy. And what is that? What's the first thing that we see? Your prayers, right? He says, pa Paul knows the power of prayer, right? How many of you have been praying this week? I hope so, right? We got to be praying. And Paul knows the power of prayer. But what he knows even more is the encouragement of prayer. Put that together. Paul not only knows that there is power in prayer, but he also knows that there is encouragement given through prayer. The Word tells us to pray for one another, to in intercede, right, for one another, to, um, to encourage one another, right? All of those one another. We went through all of those, right? How do we do that? We do that through prayer. And these Philippians didn't just say, oh, yeah, Paul, we'll pray for you, right? But they continued in prayer, right? They continued in prayer, and they continued to do it over and over and over again. They partnered with him in the gospel. Remember? That was at the beginning where he says, 
I am so thankful for your partnership in the gospel. Remember, we, we talked about that word. That word is koinonia, right? And, and we, we talked about the word koinonia, which is translated as fellowship or other things like that. But we said it's, it's, a, seer, it's, a, it's a different kind of bond, right? It's the kind of bond that lasts because it's in Jesus Christ. It's the kind of bond that lasts miles and years. How many of you have got a, like a best friend from high school? You, you, you know where I'm going with this, don't you? Like I've got, I've got some long-distance friends that I'm very good friends with, right? But I don't, I, there, there's times that I don't even talk to them for months. And then all of a sudden, I'll talk to them on the phone, and it's like no time has passed, right? That nothing has changed. We just pick right back up where we left off, and it's like there's nothing that holds back that relationship. That's koinonia. Now, how do the Philippians continue to maintain this koinonia with Paul. I mean, they don't have telephones. They don't have Zoom. They don't have Facebook, right? How, how do they stay connected with Paul? How do they get this, this deep, abiding friendship, loyalty, um, koinonia fellowship with Paul? How do they do it? It's their prayers, right? Because God keeps those prayers alive and keeps that connection bonded. And this stretches over more than five years because Paul went to them five years ago. It stretches over 4,000 miles. He's in Rome. They're in Philippi. And yet he says, I am so, I, there's, there's such joy because I know that through your prayers, something has happened. I can remember when my stepdad, um, before he passed a few years ago, um, he, would, he would constantly tell me, we'd be on the phone, and he'd say, I'm praying for you. And I'm like, man, I know. I can tell. I can feel it. And he says, and by the way, he says, you need the prayers, and I need the practice. That used to be a saying all the time. I was like, yeah, that's good. That's good, right? You need the prayers, and I need the practice. And, 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 and there's just this thing. That's the amazing part of being part of the body of Christ. It has no boundaries, no limitations. The relationship that we create doesn't matter if it's years down the road. It doesn't matter whether it's thousands of miles away. That there is a bond that happens in the spirit. And it lasts. No time, no space can break that coin in the bond. So these people press in and they pray for Paul. And he can feel the encouragement and the joy that they're praying for him. Anyone ever experienced that? Where you knew somebody was praying for you, like in the midst of it, right? I have. There have been moments where it's like, man, I don't know how I got through that thing. But somebody was praying, right? The second thing that keeps Paul rejoicing is this, the provision of the Spirit. Now, I love this phrase. Uh, there are a couple significant ideas that we need to see in this phrase. The first is, is simply where it comes from. Where does it come from? Huh? Fr from the Spirit, right? From the Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit, by the way. But don't, don't miss that. Okay, now, now, one of the things that is interesting in the New Testament, as we look at the Holy Spirit, he's referred to in many, many ways, right? 
one of the ways he's referred to is by himself, like the Holy Spirit, right? Other times, he is referred to as the Spirit of God, right? And yet other times, he is referred to as the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, does that mean that these are three different spirits? Ask the question. No. No, 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 no. Okay? Not three different people, not three different spirits, right? They're all the same spirit. So why does Paul use the term, the spirit of Jesus Christ, here? Why didn't he just say the spirit of God or the Holy Spirit, right? Why does he choose this phrase? I believe the reason why Paul uses the spirit of Jesus Christ in this moment is it is a reminder to these believers of what Jesus says in John chapter 14. So turn to John chapter 14 for a minute. John chapter 14, Jesus introduces to the disciples the Holy Spirit. And he introduces him in a very specific way. John chapter 14, uh, verse 25, we see that Paul is referring back and he's reminding them of this promise that God has given. John 14, 25 says this, All this I've spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and what? Remind you of everything that I've said to you. Right? And then he keeps going and he says, peace, I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Do you see it? Do you see what Paul is doing? Paul, in the midst of his trials and in his circumstances, the Holy Spirit, the people are praying for him, right? And he feels that encouragement. But along with that comes the Holy Spirit who is reminding him. And he's saying, look, Paul, I know this isn't a good spot you're in right now. But I want you to remember Jesus' words. He's going to bring to remembrance the words of Christ. And what are those words? I'm with you. My peace I'm giving to you. And it's not the worldly kind of peace. No, I, I'm bringing you a peace inside. So don't let your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid. This is a reminder that, that no matter what the situation, no matter what the difficulty, no matter what the, the problem. Your joy, my joy, is found in our relationship with Christ. It's where it all comes from. If we lose sight of our relationship with Christ, that's where our joy goes away. Let me ask the question. Let's just test that, that thesis, right? When you get frustrated, when you get down, when you get depressed, when you get when 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 the world's circumstances pile up on you, are you thinking about your relationship with Jesus? Oftentimes I'm not. When it's hitting me, I've totally forgotten about that. Right? I'm focusing on something else. I'm focusing on the circumstances, on the situations, on the difficulties, on the problems. But Paul says, no, no, no. Fix your mind right where it needs to be. And the Holy Spirit is going to come alongside. He is going to remind you of what Jesus said. My peace I live with you. Right? Now, the word provision here, um, we go back to that to that verse there. The word provision 
um, is, is a powerful, powerful word. The word is, uh, my wife corrected me on the grammar, so I'm just going to have you do it again. Okay, Denise, give it up. Thank you, Denise. She's much better at pronouncing Greek words than I am. Epikuresia, okay? Now, epi, anyone know what epi? Okay, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of places where we see the word epi. Epi is on or over, okay? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a modifier, right? But what do you see after epi? Choresia. Do you, do you see a word that's there? Oh, okay, there, there it is. That's, that's exactly the word, choir. Okay, chorus, right? That's the word that it comes from. Now, this is really weird. This word is only used four or five times in the entire New Testament. It's a very strange word, especially here, because it means on behalf of the choir. And we go, what? What does that have to do with, like, because remember, it's provision, right? Another, uh, uh, the, the old King James calls it supply. And we go, where do you get, on behalf of the choir, where do you get that? Well, this, this word actually has a root in ancient Greece. Because remember, they're speaking Greek, right? And this word, uh, thousands of years ago in, in, in classic Greek, there was a moment where there was this huge chorus, this dramatic company uh, that were practicing endlessly for this huge um, theatrical performance. And, and they had, they put so much time, so much energy, so much effort, so much practice. It was timely fi- time for the show to begin, right? Time for the show to get on the road there's one major problem. Guess what the problem is? They ran out of money. Right? They ran out of money. They'd done all the work, but they couldn't afford to do it. These people had given their lives to the production, and they'd committed all of their resources to making it work but they ran out of money. And because they ran out of that, the show was over. They weren't able to do it. But just before they closed the show, a wealthy man had heard of the crisis. And he stepped into the middle of the situation, and he made a huge financial contribution. And he said, this is on behalf of the choir. And that's the root of this word. The root of this word is the idea that when you have exhausted everything that you have, that's when the Holy Spirit becomes the supply. When you've exhausted all of your energy, when you've gone everything that you can do, and by the way, the sum of money that he provided was over and abundant and far beyond what they could have ever imagined. They never had a problem. And this is the same word that Paul grabs from classic Greek literature, and he pulls it forward and he says, when you've run out of steam, when you've given every effort and you just feel like, I'm done. Anyone been there? Remember, we're talking about perseverance. When you've done everything that you can do and you're just like, okay, I just give up. The prayers of the saints and the epigraph, whatever it is, right? On behalf of the choir, the supply 
of the Holy Spirit speaks into your heart, speaks into your life, and he steps in and he helps you. And Jesus becomes your benefactor. This is how we persevere. This is how we push through. It's amazing, right? So when Paul is feeling exhausted and feeling like all hope is lost, the Holy Spirit begins to do his work. And and not only does the Holy Spirit just like prick his heart, right? It's not just a prick. It's an overflowing, abundant joy that Paul begins to experience and go, Yeah, I know I'm chained. I know I can't go out and do what I want to do. I can't even provide for myself. I have, to, I have to let others take care of me. But there's joy. And it's not just joy in the circumstance, but instead it's a joy for the future. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Look at what he says. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me, remember that's what's what's all the bad stuff, right? Will turn out for my, what? Deliverance. Now, I I want you to notice, Paul is looking forward. It will turn out, right? It will turn out for my deliverance. Paul is looking forward to the day when he is going to be delivered from this situation, right? When he is going to be delivered from this situation. Now, some people think, that Paul is speaking of heaven. That's possible. Let me just say that up front. It's possible that he's thinking of that day when he will finally be set free. Others think that Paul is actually looking forward because he thinks he's going to get set free from prison. Right? Like this actual confinement, physically, this confinement. And that's also a very strong possibility. In fact, as I was, as I was studying for this, um, I, I came across um, a timeline issue that I'd never seen. Can I, can I give it to you? Paul is in the Roman prison. He is, he is, he is chained to a guard. And in Acts, it says that this lasted for two years. But Paul doesn't die for many years later, and we know that Paul dies in prison. So there's a gap of time that happens from what Acts says and what we know happened. And there's there's some hints all throughout Scripture in different parts of his writings like 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, these other writings, where he talks about, like, I long to come to you, and I'm going to be here, and I'm going to be there, and those types of things. But when you look at the book of Acts, you actually see, there's, we, we only see, um, is it four? Three. Three missionary journeys, four missionaries. One of, one of them. We only see in the book of Acts a certain sequence of events. And then it stops talking about Paul. And it goes on to talk about some other things that are going on. And so what what is interesting is is that we don't see a direct travel log for Paul. But we do see that he spends time other places outside of Rome after this point. And so Paul is saying to these guys, to these, these Philippians, I am looking forward to coming and seeing you again. And so Paul has got this hope built in that 
he could possibly be set free. Look at it again. I eagerly expect and hope, verse 20, that I will in no way be ashamed, but I will have sufficient courage so that now, as in always, I will be exalted in the body, whether by life or by death. Paul is looking forward, right? And he's either looking forward to heaven or he's looking forward to this being released. But don't miss this fact because this is part of the secret of joy in difficult circumstances. Looking forward, right? Looking forward has a lot to do with how you're going to respond in a circumstance, right? If you look back, what are you going to see? Trouble, right? If you look at the present, what are you going to see? Trouble, right? But if you look forward, guess what you see? Possibility, right? And so no matter what, Paul is in this circumstance, and he is looking forward to the possibility, to the potential, to the hope. I've said this a few times, but I want you to hear this. This is, this is crucial for us to understand mindset. What you fix your eyes on is what you will see. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Right? We can look at the, the, the story of, of Peter in the boat, walking on the water. All of a sudden, he takes his eyes off of Christ, puts it on the circumstance, and guess what? What does he do? He sinks. Jesus calls to him and says, hey, Peter, right back up. Why? Because what you fix your eyes on is what you're going to see. What you look for, you will find. If you look for a reason to be depressed and down and frustrated and, man, I just can't deal with this, guess what you're going to see? The problem. The mindset. Right? What you focus on is what you will see. Look, look at what Scripture says in Jeremiah 29. I don't even know if I have this verse in there, so I probably don't. Okay, Jeremiah 29, 13 says this. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Right? If you're looking for something, you're going to find it. All the way back in the Old Testament, Jesus says, you are going to seek me. And when you seek me, you are going to find me. If you seek me with all of your heart. In other words, you're fixed. Your gaze is fixed. You're looking for the right thing. Look at verse 20. I eagerly expect and hope. I eagerly expect and hope. These, these, these are actually two different Greek words. Eagerly expect and hope. And he strings them together. And guess what? what? Guess what they mean? Pretty much the exact same thing. Do you see? Once again, rep repetition in the New Testament matters, right? Whenever you repeat an idea, it's a modifier. It's a, it's a, it's a multiplier, right? And he's repeating this idea. To eagerly expect means to look forward with great longing. Right? Like, oh, I cannot wait. Any, anyone got a vacation plan this year? Do you know what I'm talking about? When you eagerly expect. Like, I cannot wait to take that vacation. Right? Your brain is constantly thinking about it. It's constantly focused on it. My, my, my wife and I, we vacation with our sister, or with her sister and their family. Every two years, we have a vacation with them. And guess what happens? We get done with our vacation, and the next thing that we talk about is, okay, where are we going in two years? 
and we start planning, right? Why? Because we're eagerly expecting it. We're looking for it. We're longing for that time when we can get back together again because we enjoy one another's company. And Paul is saying the exact same thing. He says, I'm eagerly expecting. I'm looking forward to that day. And then he uses that word hope. Now, we've preached on hope a lot, right? Advent, we always talk about hope. What is the definition of hope? I'm going to give it to you. I know you know it. I know, we're not at Christmas time. You can't remember it. Okay? There it is. Confident expectation that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. Right? That, that God has given you a word. He's given you a promise. He has said something to you. And now, you put it in the bank and you go, it's going to happen. That's hope. Biblical hope. Now, we have a problem because we, we count hope as like, well, I hope this happens. Right? And we talk about it in that way. Like it's, well, it might or it might not you know, I'm not going to say it will because maybe if it doesn't, then I'll be disappointed. So I hope it happens. But that's not biblical hope. That's not the word. The word here is that confident expectation that God is going to come through in the end. And it's the reason why it's used for our salvation and the coming of heaven. Why? Because it's confident expectation. You should have inside of you that point where you go, I am so looking forward to that day. Right? I am so looking forward to the day when Christ comes. Because guess what? I'm not going to wake up at 5 in the morning with a backache. Praise God. Amen. That's what happened to me this morning. You know what I'm talking about. I'm going to have a brand new body. It's going to be much thinner than this. It's going to look good. I'm going to be buff, right? No. But you hear what I'm saying. Like, there's a confident expectation that that will happen. And so Paul is longing for this day. What is this day? His deliverance, right? What does that look like? This is why people think he's thinking about heaven, because of the words that are used. But we also see that timelining, he did get out. And guess what? He went and visited these people. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. But look at what he says he's looking forward to. Not just that day. He's looking to something specific. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed. And I will have sufficient courage. Why would Paul be ashamed? There it is. He's not in an honorable position right now. He's in prison. People are talking bad about him. Right? People are going around saying, yeah, did you see Paul's in prison? We knew that was going to happen. Right? Can I tell you? <laughs> I just want you to hear this. Things are not looking good for Paul. But there's always ac accusations. There's always going to be somebody who's going to talk negatively. Yeah? Am I wrong in that? Always going to be that. You're always going to experience those people who will say bad things about you. Whether it's true or it's not, it's still going to happen. And Paul is dealing with this. He's struggling with it. And can I tell you, even if somebody doesn't, there is one who is the accuser. Do you know who that is? The enemy. It's Satan. He's called the accuser of the brethren. 
Can you imagine what's going through Paul's mind right now? Put yourself in his position for a moment, right? Paul's a prisoner in chains. Things aren't looking good. He's not able to provide for himself. People are saying bad things about him. They're stirring up trouble for him. What's the enemy whispering in his ear? There it is, right? Oh, you're some, you're some prophet of God. You're some, you're some strong man of God. Look at where you're at. You're never going to get out of this. Rome, Rome is, is powerful. You're never going to deal with that. And inside Paul's ears, he is hearing the accusation, you're a failure. Who would want to listen to you? You're a prisoner. Who's going to listen to you? Your ministry is over. You hear that? You hear the lies? That's the way the enemy works. He's the accuser of the brethren. And I'm sure... He heard that voice on a regular basis. I'm sure of it. But Paul is eagerly expecting and longing in hope. She's going ahead of me. It's all good. It's all good. No, 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 no. You're connecting the dots, right? But I want you to hear that accusation is a, is a, is a joy stealer, right? The enemy's voice is going to be a joy stealer, right? We have, to, we have to ask ourselves a question. I've asked this question to many people over many years. What voice are you listening to? What voice are you listening to? And it's usually not a physical voice, right? It's inside. And can I tell you, you have to begin to distinguish the voice of truth. The voice of truth tells me a different story. Casting crowns, great song, okay? Okay? But, but here's the deal, right? The, the truth comes from Jesus, the lies come from the enemy, and you're going to hear both. You've got to learn to distinguish that voice and go, wait a minute, what is that? Because that will steal your joy if you're not careful. So Paul says, I expect and I long for the day when this is all over and that I am vindicated and I don't have any shame. I'm not a prisoner anymore, but instead, now here's the key, that I will display courage to the end. Remember we talked about the character trait of endurance, right? And how it's very much lost in our culture today. Here's another character trait that Paul lists that's lost in our, in our culture today. Courage. How do we define courage? Here's the problem. In our world today, we define courage by pushing through, right? And being bold. And can I tell you, that isn't what courage is. Courage is doing what you don't want to do, even when it's hard. Courage, courage has nothing to do with not having fear. Right? Anyone Wizard of Oz fan? Right? The cowardly lion. Right? <laughs> them up, right? Okay, right? We, we, we've got the cowardly lion, and he wants heart, right? What is heart? Courage, right? Now, what is courage? Is it not being afraid? No. It's persevering even while you're 
It's stepping into the fray even when things aren't good. That's why courage is lost in our culture today. Because we still lost perseverance. Let's wrap it up. Verse 20. I eagerly expect and I hope that in that I will in no way be ashamed, which, by the way, Paul refers to this again later in Ephesians where he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the power of God and for salvation. First to those who believe. Right? But he says, that I will in no way be ashamed, but I will have sufficient courage so that, now, stop right there, so that, I want you to circle those two words if you write in your Bible, I encourage you to write in your Bible, by the way, okay, because it's good. So that is kind of like therefore, right? Therefore says, go back to what we were just previously talking about, okay? So that does the exact same type of thing, only it's saying this is a result of the previous, right? And so when he says this, he says, I am expecting and I have hope that I will not be ashamed but I will have sufficient courage so that now as always, so he says now and continuing, right? Now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. There's four, there's four little pieces to this that I want us to see. Christ will be exalted in my body by life or by death. Now, the by life and by death, we're going to pick up probably next week. We'll touch them just very, but remember, what's the next verse? For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. So he's going to continue that theme. Just warning you up front, right? But I want us to look at these other two phrases for just a moment. That Christ will be exalted. So that now and always, right, Christ will be exalted. Now, that word exalted literally, literally means magnification. Right? That Christ will be magnified. Now, when I think of magnification, I think of two things. Telescopes and microscopes. I think of both of those when I think of magnification. Right? Here's the question. How do we, as believers... Magnify Christ. Because that's what Paul says. He says, I am looking and I'm longing that Christ will be magnified in my body. Either by life or by death. And we have to ask ourselves, like, first of all, does God need to be magnified? We know, yes, he does, but... God's so big, right? What, how do we do that? Here's, here's, this, here's the thing, and I, I want you to hear this. Telescopes, telescopes bring small objects, I'm sorry, bring big objects, Closer, right? A telescope is small on its own behalf. It's a small object. Magnifying a very big object, but what is it doing? It's bringing it closer, right? Think of that analogy just for a second. To the everyday person, Christ is far away. Right? When you're looking at your problems, what looks bigger? 
the problem or Christ? Right? But the reality is that we become telescopes of who God is, especially when we're going through difficulty. Because when we go through difficulty, when we go through challenges, when we go through problems, if we fix our eyes on Jesus, he becomes larger. He becomes the thing that we see more than the problem. And guess what that does? That magnifies him both in our lives and in the lives of other people. Because when we do that and we make God big, in the midst of the problem, people go, what in the world are you doing? How in the world do you do that? How do you not get just totally wrapped up in the problem? Because we're magnifying the Lord. Yeah, God's big, but we're bringing him close, right? We're bringing him in to the situation. Now, that's the telescope. Think about a microscope. What's a microscope do? Make small things big. Can I tell you as well in our world, Jesus is small. Right? How many people really think about Jesus? Right? But when we, as believers, in the midst of problems, we go, you know what? God is great. And I'm going to have joy no matter what. When we do that, guess what? God gets a little bit bigger. We magnify him. And we show the world what it looks like to be a believer. Telescopes bring distant things closer. Microscopes make small things bigger. And we, as believers, do both in the midst of circumstances, in the midst of trials, in the midst of problems. When we persevere, we magnify God. But I want you to hear this. Look at what Paul says. He says, I want you, I, I'm looking forward to the day that I now and always that I would magnify Christ in my body, right? It's not something intangible, right? Paul's not talking about, oh, yeah, I've got this don't worry, be happy kind of attitude, right? <laughs> don't worry, be happy, right? not talking about that. He's talking about, I am going to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the body of Christ, right? So when Paul says that he would be magnified in my body, he's not talking about just a mental idea. He's saying that mental idea works out into the way that I act, the way that I present myself, the way that I talk to people, that it's physically, tangibly magnifying Christ. It's proclaiming how big God is. And this is what Paul is saying. I cannot wait because I'm going to have the courage to do this. And he's already doing it, and he's going to continue to do it. Right? So we become the lens that makes a little Christ big and a distant Christ weak for other people. We become the lens. Remember earlier, Paul was talking about looking forward to deliverance. And I said, you know, some think this is heaven and others think that this is his getting out of this prison. I think it's both. I think Paul has both in mind. I think Paul is looking forward to the day when he's going to get to go and visit these Philippians. But I also think he's also recognizing, hey, you know what? 
there's also a better day, glorious day. One day, the trumpet will shout, sound for his coming. One day, his glory will shine. Wonderful today, my beloved one sing. My Jesus, he's mine. Right? So he's looking for that. And that's why he says, whether by life, right? That's the deliverance in life. Or by death, the deliverance of heaven. Either one is going to work. Because I'm going to stay strong and I'm going to persevere all the way to the end. Paul knew that the ultimate freedom is found when Jesus takes us all away, right? But he also understood that even in the darkest of situations, by the way, in life, you're going to deal with things, right? This is why we say things like, it's a season, right? What's the great thing about seasons? They change. They come and they go. Right? I can hear I can hear Sue's do everything. (laughs) I could hear it. It was like the spirit was speaking. Okay. (laughs) Paul reminds us uh, uh, the birds. Do everything. There's a season and a turning and uh, yeah, okay. Sorry. That was, I, I apologize. I had some people going, what did you hear? It was like, yeah, I, I, I heard the song already. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter, se- uh, chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. Paul says this. He says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Do you see the season kind of talk there? He's like, it's, it's light and momentary. And we go, it is not light and it sure don't feel momentary, right? Because we're in the middle of the season. But Paul reminds us, it's a season. It's going to come and it's going to go. But there's a lasting effect that's going to have eternal rewards. So, what does Paul say? So what do we do? We fix our eyes... Not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, a season. But what is unseen is eternal. Maybe, maybe today you're in a season. And it's hard. I get it. Guess what? I'm there too. But here's the good news. It's a season. And there's something better on the horizon. Persevere. Push through. Bring Christ close. Don't worry about it. It's kids playing. It's all good. We love kids playing. Bring bring Christ close. Right? Make him bigger in your life. Magnify him. Tangibly show his greatness. And look forward in hope. That is the way to find joy in the midst of the difficulty. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you. I thank you for your word. And I pray that you would just help it to to dive deep. Help us to know that our joy is found when we focus on the future, on your promises, and when we rest in our relationship with you, and we allow you to become bigger in our lives, that you're allowed to come close, that you're allowed to be part of the circumstance, instead of us saying, this is too big and I can't handle it, but instead we say, Jesus, come in, help me to deal with this so that I can magnify you, and so that we will not be ashamed 
no matter what happens, no matter what situation we're in, that we will not have any shame, that we will not listen to the enemy's lies, but instead we will persevere and we will push forward and we will stay strong to the very end. God, we pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. Good stuff? Told you, two verses. There's a lot in those two verses. All right. Well, Frank, why don't you come and give us our announcements. I just got to say something about perseverance. I've always loved that word and that concept. And my, my brain, it was just thinking about all these thoughts. And I thought, on one extreme, there's just persevering in life. And I thought about a man I spoke with this past week who was sharing his sorrows and said, I, just, I can't take it anymore. And when he got up from his table, he said, maybe that's why. And then there's persevering on your job, persevering in your marriage, persevering in your faith. And then there's just the little things every day we persevere in. Um, my place has been clean, really clean for about two weeks now. And that's, that's new for me. But it, I didn't persevere. And I think the last day and a half, it's gotten really bad. And like yesterday, I opened up the refrigerator, and my favorite mug fell out. And it broke, and the mandarin oranges fell on the floor. Those mandarin oranges, they're still on the floor. I'm going to clean them after church today. So the next two hours, I'm going to go home and clean. But think about it. How many things do you have to persevere in? Great things and small little things. All right, announcements. Most of them are, we've had many times before, three ways to give. Thank you so much for your faithful giving to the church this Afternoon. Wow, it's the end of February. We have our annual business meeting at 4 p.m. Stu Tice is going to bring a buffet of Arabic food for everybody to enjoy. So I'll, I'll make an excuse later. Just trying to, something encouraging for them to come, okay? Because they get lazy, all right? But I've got a good excuse. I've got a good excuse for later. Okay, there's no food, but it's an important meeting, so we hope that you make the sacrifice and the effort to be here. Men's Bible study every Tuesday at Ken's home, right on the lake. And Wednesday, prayer meetings at 6.30 uh, online, grace number 4 njcom Oh, Lord God, will you teach us, each one of us, how we can uniquely glorify you and magnify you through our lives. You have that task. You have that goal for us to achieve each day. And may you give us the strength, Lord God, to persevere in all the trials of life. And even, Lord God, to persevere in the good things. Persevere in studying our word. Persevere in holiness. Persevere in making you known. Persevere in prayer. We commit our lives to you, Lord. And pray you be glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.